come on. Better is one day. Better is one day. Come on, Neil. Is one day. I'm ready to rock the house for Jesus. Oh, better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your house. Lord, better is one day in your courts. And Lord, I don't want to be anywhere else but here in your presence. Better is one day in your courts. Lord, better is one day in your house. Oh, one day in your courts. A thousand elsewhere, elsewhere. Your courts, better is one day in your in your house, and in one day in your courts, a thousand elsewhere. <laughs> better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, a thousand elsewhere. Anybody glad to be in his presence? Anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. I love that old-time victory, amen, where I don't have to come into the house of the Lord and repent of my sins before I shout. I don't have to come ask God to cover me with the blood because I've been living right during the week. I didn't come to brag. I'm just saying it's okay to live holy. Amen. It's okay to come into the house of God and not be in despair and saying, Lord God, let them lay hands. Let them call me out. Let them anoint me with oil, God, because I'm just so down. Folks, that's garbage. That, that ain't God's way. God's way is to live righteously, holy, overcoming. Amen. So when you enter the house of the Lord, nobody has to pick you up. No one has to say, let me lay my hand on. Because you're so ready, you're going to go lay hands on somebody else. Amen. Are you glad to be in the presence of the Lord? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, we love your presence. God, I'm thankful to be in your house. Lord, we are excited about your word, and we pray that you will speak emphatically, that, Lord, you take the words, pull them off the page, and stamp them onto the souls of every person under the sound of my voice. Oh, God, move with fervent fire. Stir us, oh, Lord, like we've never been stirred before. And I pray, oh, God, that whatever you place within us today, we will be willing to share it with this world for your glory. In Jesus' holy name, and everybody's excited because we're getting the opportunity to say amen yeah go ahead and have a seat Woo, glory to God I'm gonna look like one of them ministers that carries one of them rags around you ever seen that well glory got one of them towels this is gonna have a part in my message so y'all just get ready get your seat belts on well happy Father's Day but that's about all you're gonna get out of me about Father's Day because God led me in a whole different direction I'm just gonna preach what he told me I'm gonna preach on a pressing matter Glory to God. Good to have our guest and anyone who uh, has been here a few times, but I don't get to see as much as i like. I want to tell you I'm thrilled to see you and I love you. Go ahead and put that picture up there of some familiar commercials. Oh, let's go to that next one. Look at that. There's Flo. Sister, Sister Flo. <coughs> if she's in church, she's got to be Sister. Y'all know Flo. Oh, there's a Snuggie. Anybody getting fed up with Snuggie? It's Snuggy Alabama, Snuggy Auburn, Snuggy everything. As seen on TV, we got, uh, there's them rocking, what are they, hamsters or mice or something for Kia? <laughs> they, they get crazy. You got Frosted Flakes. Everybody knows what that stands for, don't you? The M? What is that? No, we don't. Know. What is it? McDonald's. Coca-Cola. Oh, there's that crazy guy who's always falling off the roof or jumping on your windshield. <coughs> all state we get slammed by advertising matter of fact for those of you who are older than 30 and some older than 40 or 50 you will be able to relate to what I'm about to say I remember a day where I could watch a TV show and they'd, they'd be just a few commercial interruptions and at the most they might last about two minutes and then it was back to the show and you would average get to see about 52 minutes in an hour of an actual show. Now it's down to like 40 something, 43 or something. And we are saturated with commercials. And we're told at all times, you need this to make your life better. I remember a Jerry Lewis movie one time, um, something about he was raising some babies or something. But <coughs> um, there was a woman 
that, that was in this house, and I think he rented a room from her, and he would walk in the living room, and every time he walked in, she's sitting there watching TV, and whatever commercial came on, she already had the product in her living room, and she'd start using it right then. They said, you need to take this vitamin. She'd reach and get a glass of water and take the vitamin. They said, you need this new hair color. Man, she already had it, and she started spraying her hair. Whatever come on the TV, she was prepared. She was pretty much controlled by whatever people told her she had to have. But what I'm getting at is we are living in a world and it's been going on this way for probably 50 years or more <clears throat> that we are constantly approached with uh, people who tell us we need something. If you were to own a business, I can tell you this firsthand, you will be approached by so many people who say you need to advertise with them. You'll have every school in the, the county come say, you need to put an ad in our football magazine or, or on, on our program. You, you need to put a big sign up on the fence. And, and if you advertise with everybody who walked in your door, you'd be out of business. But everybody wants to tell you, you need to advertise with us or you need what I'm selling you. Um, so how does this relate to your message, Pastor? Well, it's because the church has begun to think this way. We've begun to think that when we come to the house of the Lord, everything's supposed to be geared toward pleasing me. I'm speaking from a perspective of just an average person sitting in the chair. I come to church because I want the pastor to preach the most awesome message. I want the best pastor in town. I want the greatest worship team because they need to make me feel good. I want chills when the praise team is singing and playing their instruments. I want the best teachers in the county. So when I invite my friends, we sit there and we feel like we have learned from almost the, the mouth of Paul himself. I won't, I won't, I won't. We better have the greatest children's program. It needs the bright lights and the lasers and everything going on that uh, excites kids. Uh, have a buffet spread out for them when they come. We need a youth program. <clears throat> that's hosting stuff that, I mean, there's just thousands coming to these events. And, and I thank God for all this stuff. But here's what I'm telling you. God never established the church to be based on consumer Christianity. Never, ever, ever was the church supposed to be a place for consumer Christianity. So we're going to look this morning and tonight, we're going to conclude, and I'm going to answer this question, but why is it that New Haven Church of God and all churches meet every week? Why do we come together? Well, I can say for one reason is there is a pressing matter at hand. There's something that God is trying to squeeze out of us. That sounds a little bit odd, but it's true. God is trying to place his hand on the church and show us there are things he has placed within everyone in this building and everyone that hears this message and everyone who even exists and he's saying that we have become so huge with blessings. We've become so enriched because it's supposed to be all about favor and, and what God can do for me that God says you've become fat, you've become spiritually obese to the point I've got to start squeezing some people. And it won't feel fun, but praise God, when he's done with us, we'll start being a blessing like we were called to be. Instead of God bless me, bless me, when God squeezes you, you'll start blessing somebody else. We need to be pressed. Brother Colton, you come up here for a moment. How many like it when the pastor pops in unexpectedly and doesn't tell you he's coming? He just knocks on the door and there he stands smiling. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Now, some people keep their house perfect all the time, so it's not a big deal. But then there's some folks where they might need a couple hours to be prepared. Well, let's imagine it. Brother Colton here, he's the pastor, and he's come walking up, and he just rang my doorbell. Now, before I get to Brother Colton, let's talk about Dirty dish towels. That's a weird message, isn't it? Dirty dish towels. I believe right now that if I went in somebody's house in this church, right now there'd be a dirty dish rag on some of y'all's sinks. Hanging over the faucet, sitting beside the sink. Man, oh, I've been meaning to wash that thing. But no, there it sits, and it stinks, and it needs to be washed, and, and at least gotten out of the kitchen. There's something about dirty dish towels, and here's, here's what I've found, is that <clears throat> we tend to use them for too long without clean, cleaning them. And I'm going to get to a point in a minute, but let's say here's Colton, and he comes to my house, and he knocks. Go ahead and knock, brother. 
Knock on that door. There you go. And he knocks on my door, and I'm thinking, well, who in the world is this? It's UPS. I've been expecting the package. So I come walking. Oh, no, it's the pastor. And so I'm like, well, well, come on in, pastor. Let's have a seat. And what if he told me, well, Brother Michael, I want to go look at your kitchen. Oh, my goodness. I'd be thinking, well, okay, you want to anoint something? You need some Crisco? What's going on? And, and I just happened to remember that there was a dirty dish towel sitting by the sink. So I'm probably going to grab that thing and, and just try to do something to get rid of it. But as the local pastor would, would have it, he probably is going to say something like, well, praise God, brother, Jesus is coming soon. Won't you say that one? Jesus is coming soon. Oh, don't that sound good? So, see, here's the perfect opportunity because when the pastor's speaking about Jesus coming, then all of a sudden you think about that old song, I'll Fly Away. And you say, well, praise God, Pastor, that's right. He is coming soon, and it won't be long till we'll all fly away, glory to God. And that gives you opportunity to get rid of the thing that you were ashamed of. Now, go have a seat, uh, Pastor. Here's, here's what I'm getting at. There are a lot of times where that... God looks at us and we have become like dirty dish towels. Oh, we're still used to clean up dishes. We're still used to polish and make things look good, but there's an odor. See, this is something I've learned. I, I can say this because I personally learned this. Uh, this is not uh, something I read in the magazine. That if you let a dish towel sit for too long on the sink, you keep washing dishes with it. Those dishes, they'll look so clean and they, they smell good because I, I poured all kind of that uh, Dawn dish detergent. Man, it smelled so good. But you know what's weird? When I go and sit back in my chair and I get a bag of potato chips, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, the dishes was washed and I start eating that chip, I get a funny smell. Those potato chips smell weird. Well, it's not the potato chips, it's my fingers. Anybody ever been where I'm going right here? You thought it smelled good because you smelled the detergent. But what was underlying got on the fingers. And when you went and sat down and started eating that chip, you smelled the leftover residue of the soured water that had been on that rag. Even though the Dawn detergent temporarily covered it up, you still smell trying to eat them chips. You smell that nasty dish rag. Now, can anybody relate? Amen. I'm preaching what I know. And here's the sad part. There's a lot of Christians doing the exact same thing as this dish towel. They keep saying, God, just keep pouring on the detergent. Pour on the oil. Keep anointing me, God. I know there's things that need to be cleansed. I know I need to be squeezed and rang out. But, Lord, that don't feel good. I want the good stuff. I want the anointing. I want to go in and be able to lay hands. I, I want to be able to speak and work in ministry. And the whole time God's saying, well, the thing is, everybody else seems to think that you're okay because they only smell my anointing upon you. But what they don't realize is when I lay you to the side after you've been used, and I go back and sit down, I continue to smell something sour. There's something within you that isn't right. And the only way it's going to get dealt with is if you let me take you after I've used you and begin wringing you out. Somebody in this building has reached a point where you're used of God and you're anointed and God loves you and people are blessed by your ministry. But God's saying, it's time for me to wring you out because unless I do, not only will I smell residue of what isn't right now, but eventually... It's going to start affecting everything you touch. It will be contaminated. So I'm come to clean somebody up. I come not to hurt you, but to wring out the towel. Oh, glory to God. I want to compare, and there he goes. I want to compare also not just a dirty towel. I want to talk about fruit for a little while. Let's talk about pressing the fruit. And there are three types of pressure. I only have time to cover one this morning. But number one, there's pressure from God. That squeezes our fruit. Number two, there's pressure from people. We'll look at that tonight. And also, number three, pressure from the enemy. So let's jump into the story of Lazarus. Now, how many has ever heard the story of Lazarus getting raised from the dead? Would you like to hear a unique version? I'm still going to read the same version I've always read, but God's given me a perspective about some things that I had not seen before. And if, if you know me, I'm always digging for something I've never heard before. And I begin to pray and seek the Lord. And he started showing me that the episode involving the resurrection of Lazarus actually was an opportunity for Mary and Martha to be pressed. You're going to see what I'm talking about in just a moment. Look at John chapter 11. We'll begin with verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair 
whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he took that or so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Now isn't that a weird thing? He loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus so much he stayed two more days. Isn't that kind of odd? They sent a messenger, Jesus, my brother's sick. Our brother's about to die. Do something. Hurry. Come fast. Emergency. 911. Call the ambulance. And it said Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus so much he waited two more days. That, that messes with my head. I'm sitting here thinking, wait just a minute. If you love them so much, then I would think, in my mind, you're going to hop on the, the nearest horse, say, hey, uh, God, emergency here, or whatever kind of emergency you want to call it. You know how the police say, I need to confiscate this. He could say, hey, Messiah needs it for a few minutes. i got to get to Lazarus. You would think that's what would happen. He loved them so much. Why is it that he would not hurry instead of extending his stay? Well, you're going to find out in just a minute. Because Jesus was trying to press something out of Mary and Martha. And if he hurried, they would never be squeezed. Mm, glory, here's, it's coming. Jesus knew that there comes a point where everybody needs to be willing to wait. Now, waiting can drive me crazy. My wife will tell you when we go to Walmart, I try to avoid going with her as much as possible because I want to get in and out in 15 minutes or less. I'm not playing when I say that. I can have a list that long and I can get out of there in about 15 minutes. Don't ask me how. I just fly. Superman. And my wife's like, oh, let's look at those socks and that outfit there. And I want to look at these cans of soup. And I'm thinking, don't you have a list? I mean, get what's on it. Let's get out of here. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of shopping. Now, I know that's not popular with some people. People love shopping. I want to get in and get out. But sometimes God's trying to teach us something, and he wants you to be willing to wait. Amen? How many has ever had to wait on the Lord to renew your strength? How many has ever had to wait when you felt like you would do almost anything to make God move faster? You would fast if it took it. You'd go call up some, somebody, well-known preacher on TV, if it would just make God move faster. And God was saying, but I'm trying to teach you something. I've got my hand on you, and I'm beginning to press you. There's something on the inside of you that's not going to come out until it's the right time. I, I'm not going to allow it to come out too fast because it won't be matured. But also, I'm going to make sure when you you're not quite ready that when I squeeze you, it will happen at the exact moment I desire it to. So God's timing is always perfect. We go to John chapter 11, verse 14 through 15. Then Jesus said to them, speaking of his disciples, he said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. I find this pretty interesting because this is what the, the one they call Doubting Thomas. Did you notice what he said there? He said, Let's go on because we're going to be willing to die with him. Let's go on that we may suffer whatever he suffers. Folks, I need you to know God's looking for some people in this room just like Thomas. I know we got the label Doubting Thomas, but he was man enough to say, Jesus, if they kill you, I'll go to the grave with you. See, I know Jesus doesn't walk this earth right now, but he's still working here. He's working through his spirit. And I'm looking for people who would be willing to stand up and defend the Savior. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I'm speaking of when people curse Jesus around you, when people curse God around you. I wish there were some people, I know there are, but I wish there were more people who'd be willing to stand up and say, I'll stand with you, Jesus. I don't care if they curse your name. I'll speak on your behalf. And I'll let people know that that name is higher 
higher than any other name. That name can conquer death, hell, and the grave. That name puts fear into the heart of every demon and devil. Oh, when people curse the name of your Jesus, be willing to stand up for the one who died for you. Amen. When they make fun of you, Jesus, when they say you're not even who you say you are, you're not the Son of God, you're just a prophet. When they say that, oh, you're just a fairy tale, and they even when they make fun of the things that you did and the things you said, I'll stand up for you, Lord Jesus, because on the day of judgment, I want to make sure I'm with the sheep and not with the goats. I want to make sure that I'm on the right side. And it does not matter how many times I have to endure persecution or people spitting in my face or people laughing about me or talking about me on the phone or on the internet when I don't know it. All that matters, Jesus, is that I stand for you because you're the one who stood up for me when nobody else could. You went to the cross when no one else could carry my sin. I'm about to preach. I hope you know it. You're the only one who could go to the grave and get up on the third day and conquer everything I would ever face. Glory to God. When Jesus is no longer popular and they strip him from the schools and they take his name out of prayers and they try to take him off of the currency of the U.S. or any other types of attacks, I'm looking for people who would be bold enough to stand with the Savior no matter what the majority may say. We'll stand with thee, dear Jesus. Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Four days, folks, is a long time when you're waiting on Jesus. When you have already sent an emergency 911 message and you've said, please come, our brother Lazarus is sick, four days seems like an eternity. You know what happens in those four days? You start wondering, what if? What if Jesus had come? What if? We had got the message to him a little bit sooner. What if we had sent our own personal horse or a particular animal so we could make sure he had time to get back here? What if something would have happened different? We don't know what caused Lazarus to die, but something did. They probably wondered, what if we could have done something to prevent his death? What if? That's what happens when you wait on the Lord. You've got to overcome the battle of what if. What if it's my fault? What if God didn't hear me? What if I've got sin in my life and God's not responding? Most of the time, that's not going to be the case. It's going to be that God's trying to teach you something and he's pressing you and he's allowing you to wait on him because only through waiting can you mature the things inside of you. Verse 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. These people were doing the only thing they knew to do, and that was to comfort the family. Did you know that Martha and Mary were probably the closest to Jesus of anybody in that town? He came visited at their house. He'd come visit with them, have supper, have times of Bible study. They'd talk about things of the Lord. So it would make sense that the people would look to Mary and Martha when they needed spiritual guidance. They would watch the reaction of Mary and Martha in order to determine what their faith should look like. See, there are people, without you knowing it, that are watching you every day. And for some of these other folks, they look at you and think, he's the closest, she's the closest one to God of anybody I know in my life. And so based on how you respond to your trials and what you face each week, each day, your family problems, your money problems, whatever it is you got going on, your health problems, based on the way you face those things, it affects people who are looking to you to see how you respond. Very important to know this. This town fed off of Mary and Martha's faith. So the only thing they knew to do at this moment was to comfort Mary and Martha. You know why? Because Mary and Martha weren't talking about resurrection. They weren't saying, oh, y'all just hold on a little while. Jesus is coming. He's going to raise the dead. If that had happened, you know what the city would have done? They'd have called everybody else from every house, got, got on the loudspeaker and said, everybody get here. Jesus is coming. Lazarus is going to raise from the dead. But these people were reacting to the faith level of Mary and Martha. So all they knew to do was to comfort the two ladies. Now, Martha, verse 20, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, there it is, Jesus is coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, isn't that funny? Like Jesus didn't know that. (laughs) Don't that sound like a, well, Lord, you know, if you'd shown up a few days ago, he wouldn't be dead. Yes, I know that. I mean, it's just funny how we do that with God. 
God, if you'd, if you'd called somebody to write me a check two days ago, this, this other one wouldn't have bounced. Yes, I know that. Well, well Lord, if, if you'd made sure that I didn't uh, go hiking that day and fall off and break my leg, then I wouldn't be in this hospital right now, Lord. It's just funny. We present the obvious to God. That's exactly what Martha did. But even now, now here's where things change a little bit. She starts speaking something that she does not see. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Folks, she had looked at a tomb for four days, and she was tired of it. Mm, glory to God, I just felt the Holy Ghost. She had looked death in the face. She had seen the destruction of whatever hit her brother and slammed him in a tomb and caused him to never be able to come back on his own power. And she looked at it, and she was fed up with four days of depression, four days of being disgusted, four days of despair. She was ready for something to turn around. Is anybody in this room fed up with staring at a tomb that offers you nothing but lost promises, offers you nothing? but death offers you nothing but despair I think that somebody in this room is getting to a place where you're saying Lord God I know you're coming up on the property and Lord Jesus everybody else all they want to do is cry and talk about how bad things are but God I know you promised me oh I'm talking under the anointing right now to somebody in this room God's promised you some stuff and you ain't seen nothing but a tomb with a, a door rolled in front of it but God says I have not forgotten you I'm walking on the property I'm showing up and if you'll have enough faith to trust in me I'll speak to that tomb and bring the thing out that you thought was never coming back oh glory 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 to God Almighty you just have to pardon me a minute because I needed to shout for just a moment hallelujah Woo, glory to God. There comes a point when you stop looking at the tomb and you begin looking at the one who can turn everything around verse 23 Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. What's funny about this is it's almost like Martha re reverted, resorted to her student self. And she began to speak what she had been taught. See, there was even debate in the temple between Sadducees and Pharisees over the resurrection of the dead. They argued about it, but Martha didn't argue. She knew where she stood. She believed beyond a shadow of a doubt, a doubt there was coming a day where the, the dead in Christ, the dead in God, the righteous, would be resurrected unto life. She knew this, and she stood solid. Here's another thing I want you to, to hear real loud that I'm preaching today. When you face that tomb, when you, I'm not talking about when you're about to die, but when you're facing things that look like they'll never come to pass, that is not the moment to begin questioning what you believe. That's when you start speaking out what you've been taught in Sunday school. When they put the pictures on the board and talked about how God parted the Red Sea and they talked about how Jesus died and rose from the dead. When they talk about stories like Moses and the Ten Commandments, you don't need to be questioning what you know is true when you're facing your crisis. That's when even when you don't feel it, even when you don't feel anything of God, you still speak what you know is absolutely right because that word will never fail you one time. Glory to God Almighty. I don't know what I'm going to do if I keep feeling so much of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm about to run in this place. He said, listen now, Jesus said to her, I am. Somebody say, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He, I feel the Lord even while I'm reading him. He who believes in me, though he may die. You know why I like this? Because it applies to everybody in this house. Stu Hilburn. It, it applies to uh, Brother David and Teresa Sherman. It applies to Richard Pike. It applies to Casey Hughes. He said, he who lives, though he die, yet he shall live. He believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this you know what I like about what he said right there he said I am the resurrection and the life see Martha knew about a resurrection but she had not comprehended that he was the resurrection oh there's a big difference when you're looking toward an event and the one who makes the event come to pass 
Oh, glory to God. She wasn't supposed to look forward to a thing or an event. She was supposed to look to the one who was the resurrection and the life. That's what Jesus was trying to tell Martha. You're not waiting for something on your calendar. You're not marking it with a highlighter. You're looking at the one who is the great I am. You're looking at the one who's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Honey, I've already walked into the future. I've already seen Lazarus get out of that tomb, but I'm waiting. I'm pressing you. I'm looking forward to seeing what's inside you being birthed because Martha, if I moved too quick, if I showed up four days ago, then your faith would not have reached the point it's about to reach. Oh, but church, I'm pressing you. I'm getting a hold of you. I'm putting my hand on you because there's something. If I move too quick, you will never get to the fruition, the maturity that I'm trying to get you to. Oh, but just hold on a little longer. Oh, I feel that old time anointing. Hold on a little longer because help is on the way. Let me touch you. Let me press you. But you got to wait until it's the right moment. Oh, hallelujah. Man, we're going to have to start having some of Richard Simmons videos around here so we can get built up and run with the preacher. Amen. I don't want you wearing out on me too quick. Woo, glory to God. He, he had to squeeze her faith like it had never been squeezed before. Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I like this because she began revealing what was deep inside her heart. She started telling Jesus, Lord, my belief in you goes beyond what the scholars say. It goes beyond what I have heard. Lord Jesus, my faith is not tied to the community of Bethany. Everybody there is mourning. But Lord, I'm seeing you're doing something behind the scenes here that, that nobody else seems to grasp. Lord God, I'm stepping out of mourning. I'm stepping out of doubt and depression and what ifs and Lord I'm stepping into who you are I am recognizing and emphatically stating that you are the Christ the Son of God who has come into the world oh hallelujah somebody give him praise verse 28 and when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard it, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. I'm going to hand you my coat, Brother Gary. Before I rip it off. Thank you, Brother. Woo. As soon as she began having a revelation, she looked for her sister. It, the Bible does not tell us the words Jesus spoke, but somehow he sent out a call for Mary because the message that Martha sent said that Jesus, the teacher, he is calling for you. And now we see the other member of this awesome family, Mary. Verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. I hope y'all got a few minutes because I, I need to go somewhere just a minute. I'm not leaving a room. I need to go somewhere in the word. When you jump ahead to John 12, I mean, you could preach a whole message a lot of ministers have on John 12. That's where that we see precious Mary entering a room full of high-class men, uh, people who had a lot of clout. And she comes running into, or walking into the room and, and breaks costly oil, uh, ointment. And, and it's matter of fact, it's so expensive, almost priceless. And she pours it on the feet of Jesus and begins wiping his feet with her hair. When... Mary was at the feet of Jesus. She had a tomb in her sights and the Son of God, the resurrection and the life up, uh, uh, above her. She didn't know this yet, but the only way she would reach a point, very likely, I can't say this 100%, but about the only way likely she would reach a point where she would be willing to give up the most costly thing in her house was if she was pressed in this moment. See, she had to see Jesus as more than the good teacher. She had to get to a level where that she would be willing to give up everything she had, if that's what it took, in order to bless the master. 
See, in order for Jesus to get Mary to a point in the next chapter where that she could come in and avoid the stares of all those men and avoid the condemnation and break that alabaster box and anoint his feet and say, I don't care what people say, I'm going to worship him. I don't care what people do and if they stare me down and if they're whispering and talking behind my back, it does not matter because I want Jesus to know he's got my heart. I want Jesus to know that he's got my passion that he's got my worship, he's got my praise. Folks, some of you got to get that way in this church. I know that we're a shouting worship in church, but there's some of you that won't move because you're always thinking, what will somebody think? Well, if I shout this week, they'll expect it next week. You know what? I don't care what people expect or what people think. It's not for them. It's for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you can ever get it through your head that I've come to worship the King, then you may just start worshiping a little different than you did in the past. Jesus was trying to press Mary. He was squeezing something out of her because just in the next chapter, she would need to go from the level of, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would have lived. She had to get from that point to a point where she walks in and has so much faith that she's willing to break the most precious thing she has and to use what we refer to as a woman's glory, her hair, to wipe off those dirty feet but she had to be pressed so she could get to chapter 12. You see, there's a lot of times where we just think things are just going to happen anyway because we're just good like that. We're just blessed. We, we love God enough where we're always going to do the right thing. But sometimes God knows you'll never be able to break the alabaster box until you've wept at his feet and said, Lord Jesus, my brother would have lived if you'd been here a few days ago. And he's got to do a miracle right here in order for you to ever break the alabaster box. You've got to go through being broken before you can break everything you've got at his feet and wash and present it to him in worship. There's people in this room under the sound of my voice that if you had not been through what you've been through, your worship would have been different. Your Oh, I feel you, Lord. Your praise would not have been as intense. But now you can hardly restrain yourself at times because when you just start back thinking of where you came from, when you just go back in your mind, even though you don't like too much, and you start thinking about all those nights you were so drunk you could have died in a vehicle, but God put his hand on you somehow and wouldn't let you go because mama or daddy had prayed over you and spoken your name up to the king and said, Lord God, I don't care how far down they go. Lord, don't let them die in their sin. God, do whatever you got to do to rescue my child. Oh, I'm telling you, church, we've got to remember the importance of getting to a place where everything is on the altar and it is broken. And we say, Lord God, I remember where you brought me from and because of my past, I'm not proud of it, but because you turned everything around and you brought me out today my praise is a lot deeper than it would have been when I was 10 years old because God when I praise you as deliverer I know what I'm talking about Woo! Glory to God. anybody know what I'm talking about today thank you holy God so we see that Mary had to be squeezed and then he said where have you laid him they said to him, Lord, I uh, uh, almost said Jesus. Colton, come here. <laughs> Jesus. Now, I like this. They didn't say, you go down to Main Street and you turn left at the local watermelon store and then you go by the barber shop over at Ed's, turn right, go about three furlongs. You'd have to throw that word in there, three furlongs. Pass that soldier that's up there on that horse. And he'll be on the, the left-hand corner. They didn't do that, did they? They said, let me make sure I say it exactly right. Lord, come and see. You see the difference? And they, well, Lord, about 10 minutes, I'll meet you over there. Uh, you know kind of where the, t the, the cemetery is. I'm going to meet you over there. i got to go get me a cup of coffee. I'll see you in just a few minutes. No, they said, Lord, come and see. 
You know what that tells me? You can have a seat. And that tells me that somebody in that group, it might have been Mary, it might have been Martha, I don't know. Somebody had so much faith in what Jesus was about to do that they said, not only will I take you, but I'll make sure I don't leave your side because I don't want to miss what you're about to do in this boy's life. I don't want to miss what's about to happen for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This whole city's about to be turned upside down. Bethany ain't going to be known like it used to be known. It's going to become a place of revival. It's going to be a place where God's going to have his will and have his way. So I will make sure that I take you to where he is so I can be right in the middle of a miracle. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God Almighty. The, now listen, in verse 35 it said that Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Isn't that just like some good church folks? You got, you're right on the brink of a miracle. And they're saying, well, wouldn't it have worked out a lot better if he'd shown up a few days ago? Wouldn't that make sense? Can't you see the committees forming? They're saying, well, we know Jesus is all that, but still, wouldn't it have made more sense if he had shown up a few days ago and, and, and we'd never got to the point? I, I wouldn't have had to go into the expense of, of the burial. I mean, you imagine Mary and Martha getting, getting that attitude. Thank the Lord they didn't. But what if they got mad and said, Jesus, don't you realize how long it took us to prepare my brother's body and we had to anoint him and clean him and, and, and we had to use some of them wraps that we put on his body and I was really wanting a new shirt. And I was going to make Mary a new dress. And that, we had to use that material to wrap our dead brother because you didn't show up on time. Wouldn't that be like church folk? Amen. Lord God, if you'd done something quicker, we <laughs> Oh, this is funny. I'm going to say this, but it's not a negative thing. It's actually awesome about y'all's faith. But I was talking to Casey Hughes this morning. And they were talking about decorating the youth room and saying, isn't it going to be funny? If we get this thing just the way we want it, and then God gives us an, another location and we move. I thought, hey, that's all right. Everything you do, do it is under the Lord. And I know they won't be offended if that happens. If they get everything just right and then God opens up another door, we'll just take what we got with us and start over. Amen. But there's, there's some people, they get so upset when God moves because they think we had everything exactly the way we thought it should be. And then you came in, shook the house up. You, start, you started bringing in people who were addicted to cocaine. You started bringing in people who were covered in tattoos. We thought we had our perfect little church here and everything looked good. And then you started bringing in a bunch of folks who uh, slept together and we got gays and we got all other kind of people. Here's the awesome part. When God starts shaking the house and starts moving, I'm thankful I don't care who walks in the door because I know one thing when they taste and see that the Lord is good when they start feeling the fruit that's pressed out of us and when they feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost they probably are not going to lead the same as they came oh glory to God I'm glad when God shakes up our agenda and he shakes up what we think is status quo and says hey you think you got everything just right then I'm going to send somebody in there and mess you all up because you've gotten too comfortable I got to get you to a place so that when the worst sinner in Southside walks through those doors you're going to open up your arms you don't care how he smells how she looks, what they talk like, if they let out a curse word in the foyer, you ain't going to be worried about that junk, you're going to say come here let me love you honey, because Jesus died for you oh let me put my arms around you and show you what the love of the father really feels like I might just have to shout on that one if I hadn't been preaching that and I'd probably been in the aisle just that well I was in the aisle wasn't I hallelujah, Woo! I got to hurry and finish this story then Jesus, verse 38 Again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Man, I'm about to get on something good here. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. You know what I like about that verse? He didn't say, Father, I thank you that you're listening to me. He said, Father, I thank you that you have past tense heard me. That, you know what that tells me? Jesus didn't wait till he got at the tomb to have prayer meeting. Oh, hallelujah. He didn't wait. 
wait till he showed up and Mary and Martha fell at his feet and said, well, hold on, let me pray just a minute and seek the will of the Father. No, he knew the will of God before he ever stepped into the cemetery. Oh, hallelujah. See, that's the thing. We, may, we expect to get to the house of God and we're going to show up and sit on a pew and we think the Holy Ghost is just going to put a word in us and we're going to get up here and say something off the top of our head and it's going to be anointing to God because we got an unction. But here's the thing. Don't you ever stand up and speak before this church until you've been on your face in prayer. I'm not talking about a testimony. Sometimes you got to share what God's done in your life. But I'm saying when it comes to ministry and you do something that God's wanting to raise you up to do and impact your community and your local body, you better make sure you have spent time before the throne room. Jesus didn't wait till he got to the tomb to pray. He said, Father, you have heard me, past tense. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. In just a few minutes, we're going to find out. That's a very important verse. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Aren't you glad God's specific? Aren't you glad that God knows your name? That God speaks to your situation. He doesn't just do a blanket blessing or a blanket deliverance and say, well, I'm going to look at Rainbow City or I'm going to look at Southside. I'm just going to send a wave of this to them. No, he gets in your house. He gets in your vehicle. He sits in the car seat beside your baby. He's the one that gets close to where you are. He lays beside your bed at night. He's the one that stands with you when you're in the kitchen cooking with the pots in the pan. He's the kind of God that gets specific with his people. I, I love that because that means... As soon as I bring up something I'm going through, he's not a stranger. He's not like some judge that I go before and say, Lord, I, or judge, I need your help. I need to make my petition. No, when I stand before my God, he already knows what I'm going to say before I say it because he was there when we went through it. He was there when we suffered. He was there when people talked about us. He was there when we didn't feel good and we got up and went to church anyway and did what we're supposed to anyway. Oh, but when you make your petition known to God, he already knows and he sympathizes with everything. Everything you feel. Got to wind this down somehow. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. It's going to be one of my last points. He was out of the tomb, but he was still wrapped with grave clothes. There's something, something symbolic there when it comes to Christianity. There's a lot of people who have accepted him as Savior, spoken the name, heard him call them out of darkness and out of death, but they're still wrapped in grave clothes. This goes against everything that God has ever ordained for your life. See, the thing is, there's too many Christians that walk around saying they've been redeemed, but they keep smelling like the tomb they just came out of. They look like death. They, they still show resemblances to what God was supposedly delivered them from. They're wrapped up. They're bound. They're not free to move. But God has come to tell somebody, I didn't just call you out of darkness so that you wouldn't be dead or you wouldn't spend eternity in hell only I called you out to set you free you're supposed to be an example of who I am on this earth if you walk around bound what kind of testimony is that going to be to this world they don't need to see somebody hooked on drugs hooked on pornography can't quit sleeping with their boyfriend or their girlfriend they need to see somebody who's holy unto the Lord who walks with a robe of righteousness get off the grave clothes come back into the family get back in oh I feel him now Stu get up here and play get back in the family Jesus has called you out of darkness Get those grave clothes off and walk in holiness unto God Almighty. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord is calling us to rip those grave clothes off. Altar service just shifted. God said, I'm calling people to rip off the old ways. Not just to come out and say you're saved, but to live like you're saved. Talk like you're saved. Behave like you're saved. Look like a Christian. Look like Jesus in this world. Stand with me this morning. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God's already given the altar call. I don't even have to say anything right now. If he's talking to several in this room, and I know he is, 
make your way to this altar and God is going to begin taking off one strand at a time everything that has bound you to the old tomb everything that's kept you holding on it's like you can't get far enough away because you're still connected but God says I've come to sever the cord I've come to rip off the grave clothes if you'll let me in the name above every name I call you now saints of God pray please pray Pray, pray, pray. Hallelujah. Grave clothes coming off. Been bound up. Can't hardly move for God. Mm. Other people around me walking in freedom. Able to flow in that spirit and I'm just so bound up. Got to release some things and leave them in the tomb. We got one up here praying. I'm expecting at least five people. In the name of Jesus, it's time to be free. It's time to be free. It's, I, I'm not just coming out of a tomb, Lord. I'm getting rid of everything that smells like it. Oh. We're about to pray with these. Come on, yeah, y'all go ahead. Start ask them what they need from the Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you know what you're feeling. You know what you're feeling. You know it's God calling you. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> 